I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support too. That's where Ollie comes in with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Welcome back, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery. This is the China History Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. History of Taiwan, Part 5 today. Well, we finally made it to the 20th century. Well, actually, not yet, but we're pretty close, and we'll get there today. We finished off last time with Japan's victory over China in the First Sino-Japanese War. As part of the terms of the Treaty of Shimonoseki, signed April 17, 1895, China handed the island of Taiwan to the Empire of Japan. Earlier, back in 1879, Japan's 66-year march in the direction of its ultimate destruction, had already begun with the annexation of the Ryukyu Island chain. Now in 1895, they picked up Taiwan and Penghu, and that is what we'll start looking at in this Part 5 episode. Anyway, if no one has any objections, I'd like to mention a couple other things that were also happening in Taiwan. Judging by the main narrative so far, you'd think Taiwan's history was all just attempts at colonizing and rebellions and wars, invasions, and indigenous people fighting with anyone who came near to them. I know I covered much of this in my tea history series and tea history podcast, but during the Qing dynasty, Taiwan's famous tea industry was launched. Tea was already growing indigenously on the island, but like it was in China in pre-Luyu days, the quality of the brew wasn't yet anything you'd look forward to drinking yourself. The Dutch wrote about the tea they encountered in Taiwan. Remember, the Dutch people were the very first Europeans to bring this necessity of life to market in The Hague in 1610. So during the period of Dutch colonization, when they saw it, well, they knew what it was. Someone named Ke Chao brought tea plants from Fujian to Taiwan in the late 18th century and planted them in Reifang District, just east of modern-day Jilong, But things really began to hot up only in 1855 when one Lin Feng Chi brought cuttings from tea plants that produced Fujianese Qingxin Wulong tea. And Lin Feng Chi planted them in the rich and optimal soil of Dongding Village, Lugu Township, Nanto County. So into the 1860s, the makings of a national tea industry was in place. But it was John Dodd and Li Chunsheng, who combined their talents and resources to scale up the smattering of family or temple-managed tea gardens into a full-fledged operation. These two are often referred to as the fathers of Taiwan's tea industry. Li Chunsheng, he came from Xiamen and had some background and understanding of tea cultivation. Following the end of the Second Opium War, during one of his business trips to Taiwan, John Dodd, an experienced trader already in his 20s, recognized the potential of the place. In 1865, he met the acquaintance of Li Chunsheng, and he became Dodd's comprador and right-hand man. And because of his tea savvy, right away, Dodd recognized the potential of Taiwan's tea. The climate and topography were perfect. Together, John Dodd and Li Chunsheng began growing tea in the hills of Mu Jia, just south of Taipei. Today, the second to the last stop on the Taipei Metro Brown Line, Li Chunsheng scaled everything up quickly, signed up farmers to give tea production a chance. No expense was spared to invest in equipment that increased production and efficiency. The picked tea leaves were shipped across the strait and finished off in Fujian. And after packaging, the tea was shipped to markets in the U.S. and Europe. It began like this, jobbing out the critical processing part to the experts in Fujian. But in time, Taiwanese growers provided all the value-added processing to the raw tea leaves and figured out how to make them yield their special qualities. 
The big break for Taiwan's tea industry came in 1869 with the opening of the Suez Canal. Dodd and Company shipped over 140 tons of tea to New York, branding it as Formosa Oolong. With this exotic-sounding name and the visions it surely conjured up in the minds of Westerners, along with its unique oolong taste, it became an instant hit, particularly with the swells of high society. So now, with the Fujian middleman cut out of the supply chain, Formosa oolong tea became a big business overnight. Word travels fast wherever and whenever money's involved. Others heard of Dodd's and Li Chunsheng's success in growing tea in Taiwan, and this led to an influx of competitors hopping on the oolong tea bandwagon. Taiwan's tea industry was initially centered in Dadaocheng on the Danshui River, part of today's Datong district of Taipei. Domestic consumption and exports grew quickly. And this spike in world demand created a massive need for tea pickers and tea industry workers, mostly women. Later on, during Japanese occupation, they introduced black teas from Assam to Taiwan, trying to get a piece of the milk tea market that had been so successfully exploited by Thomas Lipton's tea company. I mentioned him last episode, but one other reform instituted by Liu Mingchuan involved setting up a Formosa Tea Trade Association that did a lot to help maintain quality and product integrity, and like all these trade associations do, they assisted Taiwan growers in developing overseas markets. Tea became Taiwan's biggest export after sugar and camphor. In time, oolong tea, though first developed in Fujian, would become synonymous with Taiwan, or more popularly as Formosa oolong. In 1919, tea growers in Taiwan began growing Tieguanyin Iron Buddha tea from seeds transplanted from Anxi, where it all began for this great and famous tea. Today, oolong is harvested five times a year in Taiwan between April and December. Taiwan is the 12th largest tea exporter in the world. Last year, in 2021, the island accounted for 1.5% of world tea exports. The other big export of Taiwan that played a big role in the economy was camphor. Since the 1860s, the British had been trying to muscle in on Taiwan's camphor trade, a monopoly that was jealously guarded by the Qing government. Taiwan's northeast was the Saudi Arabia of camphor back then. Camphor is a waxy substance that has a strong smell. It comes from steaming the wood chips of the camphor laurel tree, in a process that caused this substance to be excreted by the camphor wood. And this crude camphor already had a multitude of uses before 1889, when George Eastman came along and started making movie camera film from celluloid, which is derived from camphor. So camphor was a very hot commodity at the dawn of the 20th century. Among celluloid's early uses was as a replacement for elephant ivory. Camphor later on had critical applications in arms and weapons manufacturing, including the production of smokeless gunpowder. It was also great as an insect repellent. Mentholatum ointment derived from camphor was used to cure chest colds, and camphor was the primary active ingredient in mothballs. This was also one of those businesses that ended up being dominated by Hakka people in Taiwan. In the beginning, they acted as workers, harvesting the trees and producing the extract. And later on, a few became industrialists, managing an integrated camphor operation. More about camphor in a bit. So, Taiwan, on the eve of Japanese occupation, was no longer this sleepy backwater place. The opening of the treaty ports and the Relentless attempts throughout the 17th and 18th centuries by European traders to buy and sell there really ginned up Taiwan's economy. By the time Japan arrived in 1895, the island was ripe and ready for unfettered exploitation of the island's natural and human resources. So let's focus in on 1895. As I mentioned at the outset, Japan and China because of this 
disagreement they had over Korea went to war. And because of the war's outcome, China lost the islands of Taiwan and Penghu to Japan. Prior to the bitter ending, Li Hongzhang had gone to all the great powers, requesting their immediate help in volunteering to act as temporary guardians of Taiwan or some other arrangement that would preclude Japan from seizing the island in the likely event of a victory over China. Now, there were no takers. When the time came to transfer formal governance from Qing China to Meiji Japan, that tired old dynasty just signed it over. Up to now, the people who were local to Taiwan, the Taiwanese, including all the indigenous people, they were already starting to let their identity harden and were beginning to view themselves as neither part of the Qing nor whoever the colonizer of the moment was. And now here came the biggest colonizer of them all, the Empire of Japan. Not everybody was happy with them at first. As we'll see, it took many months for the Japanese to tamp down the last vestiges of major resistance. So keep in mind, over the 50 years of Japanese rule on Taiwan, despite all the good they did for Taiwan, not everyone was happy the Japanese were there but you couldn't help but see the tangible improvements throughout society. In time, things began to settle down to a state of good-natured contempt for one another. The first major incident to happen following the Japanese takeover of Taiwan was the establishment of Asia's so-called First Republic. Let's take a quick look at the main figures and circumstances of this uh, ill-fated government. First and foremost, there was Tang Jingsong. He had distinguished himself fighting down in Vietnam against the French and had a working relationship with Liu Yongfu, who commanded the infamous Black Flag Army that had acted as the scourge of the French forces, trying to get that colony in Tonkin up and running. Tang was made the governor of Taiwan province in 1894, which meant uh, he didn't serve very long in this post. Aside from all the great things he did for China in the Sino-French War, we mainly remember Tang Jingsong as the president and founder of the Republic of Formosa, this first republic Asia had ever seen, or so it was touted. The Taiwan Republic was formally declared on May 23rd in Taipei, again in the landmark year of 1895. It was known in Chinese as the Taiwan Minzhu Guo, this was by no means a well-thought-out government with a mission and values that were hammered out over a period of time. It was kind of a knee-jerk reaction to the Treaty of Shimonoseki and the sudden Japanese invasion. Its purpose was simply to resist Japan. The stepping stones that led to this exciting and consequential slice of Taiwan history all started when officials in Beijing informed Governor Tang Jingsong that he only had a couple months to pack up and hand the place over to Japan. The authorities assured Governor Tang anyone who didn't want to remain in Taiwan and become Japanese subjects had two years to get their affairs in order and return to the mainland. As instructed, Tang Jingsong had this announcement posted where everyone could see it. And as expected, there was an explosion of predictable public displeasure. It's human nature to not want to be ruled or intimidated in your own country by someone from someplace else, especially when the occupier's native tongue came from a completely different branch of the language tree. Chiu Feng Jia was a protege of Tang Jingsong and came from one of the many landed gentry families in Taiwan. Chiu's people were Hakas from just north of Meizhou, they were old money, and he was the scion of those early arrivals. Chiu Feng Jia is remembered as this charismatic leader who not only tried to stand up to Japan in this dark hour, but also for calling for Taiwan independence rather than submitting. In resisting the Japanese, Chiu Feng Jia wasn't trying to curry favor with the Guangxu Emperor. His struggle with Japan was fought entirely from the prism of Taiwan independence. Once it became apparent that Chiu Feng Jia enjoyed popular support and that he had been able to build a strong militia, mostly made up of his fellow Taiwan Hakas, Tang Jingsong got down off the fence and took the side of his young protege. 
Tang had become wary of Chou Feng Jia because of the rise in his popularity. But the two had buried the hatchet, and now they were joining forces, and together they sought to create their destiny. They knew they didn't stand a chance at defending against the kind of modern army and firepower coming their way with Count Kabayama Sukenori in command. Prior to Japan's arrival, Cho had funded militia camps throughout Taiwan, and he commanded a large Hakka militia force in his stronghold of central Taiwan. But this whole military struggle was one of those things that was over even before it started. Most of the Formosa Republic leaders and officers fled days and weeks after Japan invaded. The 12,000 Japanese troops that had landed at Jilong were destined to make fast work of this republic. But it took them five months. Tang Jingsong was made president of the new Taiwan Republic. Chiu Feng Jia was made vice president. After the announcement had been made regarding the imminent arrival of Japan, most of the Qing officers and soldiers abandoned ship and sailed back to the mainland. In order to shore up their armies, Tang Jingsong called on Liu Yongfu, the Black Flag Army leader, to lend his military support for this cause. He was made head of the armed forces and mainly protected the southern part of Taiwan. May 18, 1895. It was supposed to be handover day, but when the two parties got to Jilong Bay, they were greeted by a welcoming committee that was armed and dangerous, so they went to Plan B. On May 23rd, the following announcement was sent to the Qing authorities by the Formosa Republic leaders. Quote, The Japanese have insulted China by annexing our territory of Taiwan. The people of Taiwan, in vain, have appealed to the throne. Now the Japanese are about to arrive. If we, the people of Taiwan, permit them to land, Taiwan will become a land of savages and barbarians. If, on the other hand, we resist, our state of weakness will not be for long, as foreign powers have assured us that Taiwan must establish its independence before they will assist us. Therefore, we, the people of Taiwan, are determined to die rather than be subdued by the Japanese. This decision is irrevocable. The leaders of the people of Taiwan, in council, have decided to constitute Taiwan a republic state, and all administration henceforth will be in the hands of officials elected by the people of Taiwan. Tang Jingsong, governor of Taiwan, has been appointed president of the Republic of Taiwan. The official ceremony of inauguration of the Republic will take place on May 25, 1895, at the noon hour, at which all persons, those of rank, merchants, farmers, artisans, and tradesmen, will assemble at the Militia Hall. This is a declaration of the people of Taiwan. End quote. Mind you, not a single nation, great or near great, to offer diplomatic recognition of this new fledgling republic. Tang Jingsong had to have his arm twisted a little in order to get him to go along with the whole idea. And he still had a soft spot for the Qing emperor. Following the announcement, he sent his own telegram to Beijing, further declaring that, quote, The literati and people of Taiwan are resolved to resist subjection to Japan. They have declared Taiwan an independent republic under the suzerainty of the sacred Qing dynasty, end quote. This didn't really walk back anything announced by the Republic of Taiwan government. Suzerainty isn't sovereignty. I'm sure either way, the Guangxu emperor wasn't amused. For their flag, they chose a tiger on a blue background, a symbol that lives on in our present time by those who pine for Taiwan independence. When Japan launched its invasion, Tang Jingsong's forces, based in the north, folded almost immediately. And not long after, even though he was president of the fledgling republic, Tang Jingsong bolted and headed to the mainland. Vice President Chiu Feng Jia hung in there for about three months, all the while organizing the rebels, but he too saw resistance was futile. It was left to the newly appointed Grand Marshal Liu Yongfu to keep the flame alive. Well, it took from end May when the Japanese landed 20 miles southeast of Jilong to the end of October 1895 for the Japanese to stamp out the last of these rebels. 
but not before the Japanese lost thousands of men. It had been a very hard-fought struggle, as one-sided as it may have been. If you're interested about this time, may I suggest the 2008 movie Blue Brave, The Legend of Formosa, 1895. I'll have a link to the series where you can see it on YouTube. It's all about these Taiwanese Hakka people resisting Japan at this dark hour in history. Anyway, the Japanese army, despite heavy local guerrilla pushback since landing in Taiwan, shoved their way into the central part of the island to the major city of Changhua. August 27th, 1895, the decisive battle of this five-month Republic of Taiwan period was fought there at Baguashan, or Eight Trigram Mountain. Changhua is just to the southwest of Taichung. To date, the Battle of Baguashan remains the largest military battle ever fought on Taiwanese soil. And let's all hope that it remains that way. The Battle of Bagua Mountain snuffed out the final remnants of the Formosa Republic and opened the door to the pacification and takeover of the rest of Taiwan in the south, where most of the island's early history had happened. It wasn't much of a fight. 5,000 Taiwanese troops, including Hakka militia fighters, the Japanese had about Three times that number, plus a lot more firepower. It was a good fight, but it was over within a day. To teach everyone in Zhanghua, who was boss, and not to resist them anymore, the Japanese military bombed the city. After the Battle of Baguashan, that marked the beginning of the Japanese takeover. It would take a couple more months of mopping up resistance, but Japan was in charge, and a brand new era was about to begin. For some, it would be a rough and unpleasant 50 years. But for most of the Taiwanese living under Japanese rule, the whole thing had its pluses and minuses. The horrors and violence of World War II were still four decades away. For now, Japan was eager to show everyone what an enlightened colonizer they were. Taiwan was Japan's first outing, and they were determined to transform the island into an example. And during these early years on Taiwan, they had to cross the river by feeling the stones. They didn't flood the island with Japanese migrants, not yet anyway. The Japanese presence at the outset was entirely a military one. But 300,000 Japanese would later migrate to Taiwan over the 50-year period of the Japanese occupation. The population would double on Taiwan from about 3 to 6 million. First and foremost, Japan was after the natural resources and wasted no time taking an extractive approach to Taiwan. Agriculture, natural resources, and a captive market for Japanese manufacturers and services. Every colonizer's dream. You could say the Japanese colonial officials and military took a rather heavy-handed approach in the takeover of Taiwan and in getting the place organized. And as far as the aboriginal people went, well, some of them figured out right quick that the Japanese took a different approach to them as the Qing, and they weren't so shy about letting their intentions be known that they intended to force their way into their lands and take their resources, which included camphor, something the... Japanese were very hot for. In November of the following year, 1896, there was a notable event called the Xincheng Incident. Xincheng is a township on the east coast of Taiwan in Hualien County. The native people there were the Truku, perhaps better known as the Taroko or Tailugutsu. They and the Sidik indigenous tribe were related and their lands were close by to each other. In response to Japanese incursions, in November 1896, 20 Truku warriors raided the Japanese forces and killed 13 Japanese in retaliation for alleged sexual abuses committed against some Truku women. The Japanese themselves retaliated and got their noses bloodied in the process. Things quieted down, but the Japanese army would be back one day, with a vengeance, I may add. So we'll cover that in part six. Till the day the Japanese were sent packing following the outcome of World War II, there had been a lot of fiery debate regarding their 50 years in control. 
The Qing Dynasty had 212 years to transform Taiwan, and much of their reforms didn't really commence until Liu Mingchuang's time as governor beginning in 1887. Using the achievements of the Qing Dynasty as a yardstick, the Japanese did quite a bit, particularly with the building of infrastructure and turning what had started to coalesce in the early 17th century into one of the major economies of the region. Taiwanese business interests welcomed the peace and prosperity that followed in the wake of the Japanese takeover. It wasn't just the native people who Taiwan residents had to beware of. There was a general lawlessness throughout the island, and many landed gentry acted as warlords with their own muscle to back them up. Those days were over for now. Yeah, things quieted down by 1898 to the extent that Japan didn't need to keep a strong military presence. What they relied on instead was an oversized police force to maintain order rather than the ugly face of occupation troops. These policemen served in the trenches of day-to-day rule in Taiwan. In 1902, an amnesty was offered to the last remaining holdouts still fighting Japanese rule in the mountains. Hundreds took up the offer and surrendered to the Japanese authorities. A nice banquet was held for them. 360 of them were told they would receive honors and amnesties. They were told to wear a white flower pinned to their robes or garments to identify them as the honorees. Then during the banquet, when a signal was given, all those with these identifying white flowers were shot dead. By this time in 1902, Around 12,000 rebels and resistors to Japanese rule had been hunted down and killed, and these latest ones were just added to the list. The terrible fate that awaited Japan was still far in the future, and for now, they were playing for keeps. All kinds of measures, big and small, were enacted to get people in the right frame of mind for the Japanization or Kominka movement that was later launched in 1936. Chinese newspapers were banned, so was the use of the local Taiwanese dialect. Local Taiwanese, no matter how pro-Japan they were in their hearts, were kept out of the political process for the time being, and no criticism of the government was ever allowed. All standard fear for those nations who later on found themselves under Japan's imperial boot... In the early years of Japanese colonial rule, the Meiji government in 1898 appointed Kodama Gentaro as governor general and Goto Shimpei as chief of home affairs. Despite having masterminded that red wedding-like execution of all those former rebels wearing the white boutonnieres, Goto was considered very enlightened as far as his policies went. Right away to start creating state revenue, he set up government monopolies on salt, tobacco, and camphor. The list of positive accomplishments that Goto Shinpei implemented during his tenure was impressive. A decade into Japanese rule of Taiwan, the place was completely self-sustaining economically. Goto Shinpei's ultimate objective in all these positive changes he was implementing weren't being implemented to help the people of Taiwan. It was all for the glory and benefit of Japan. Goto knew he had to mold these Taiwanese people into Japanese subjects. Goto, who served from 1898 to 1906, also instituted the Hoko system in Taiwan. Now, if you look at the kanji for the Hoko system, it's the same Chinese characters as the Baojia system that emperors had been using since the time of Wang Anshu in the northern Song. Without the tools and wherewithal of today's authoritarian regimes, the Japanese government on Taiwan used this hoko system to tightly control the population of Taiwan to a very high and efficient degree. He also put in place an island-wide police service. School systems were established, as well as a youth corps program that was able to immediately begin the indoctrination process for all those Chinese and indigenous children and begin to develop them into loyal Japanese subjects. 
a very concerted effort was made to snuff out the Taiwanese culture and any sense of Taiwanese identity that had developed steadily since the time of the Dutch in the 1620s. For example, Taoist temples were shuttered and Shintoism was actively propagated. And as I mentioned, Japanese language was taught in schools. Many Taiwanese elders today who were born in the 1930s and early 40s can still speak Japanese and have vivid memories of living under their rule. In 1900, the office of the governor general opened up Taiwan's mountainous regions for the extraction of camphor and other precious resources. This decision would set off almost two decades of deadly resistance to Japanese rule by Taiwan's indigenous people. And this period is loosely referred to as the Camphor Wars, and ultimately resulted in the deaths of an estimated 10,000 members of the Japanese armed forces and countless indigenous lives. The earliest Chinese to sail to Taiwan and all those who followed them into the 19th century, as well as the Dutch, the Spanish, French, British, and Americans too. They had all learned in varying degrees not to mess with these people. We saw how the Qing emperors made a big fuss about leaving the indigenous people alone and not venturing into that wild and mountainous eastern two-thirds of the island. Just because they didn't have the latest weaponry, sophistication, and the numbers home field advantage had worked in their favor all these centuries. But the Japanese weren't going to be deterred, as we'll soon see. You recall the 1874 Japanese invasion of Taiwan discussed last time in Part 4. They had locked horns with the indigenous Paiwan people over the killing of all those Ryukyu Island sailors who found themselves shipwrecked off the southwest coast. This expedition in 1874 was all about teaching these native people a lesson. But what ended up happening was the Japanese were the ones who got schooled. This experience suffered by the Japanese military was a valuable lesson that they took to heart later on. Under Japanese rule, Taiwan's camphor industry was scaled up to the extent that half the world's supply of processed camphor came from Taiwan. To maximize their profitability in the face of such excessive world demand in the early 20th century, the Japanese created a camphor monopoly, and to satisfy their order book, they had to go into all these forested mountains populated by Atayal or Tayal indigenous tribes and cut down all those trees and extract that camphor. The affected Atayal tribes united and attacked loggers who penetrated into their neck of the woods, And this began a series of back-and-forth confrontations that saw Japanese and indigenous fighters killing each other constantly. Already in 1896, 62 indigenous people were killed, and the Japanese were finding out that they had to use a little more force to fight back against the Atayal. As it got closer to 1900 more and more deadly confrontations occurred between these loggers cutting down camphor trees and the Atayal people who lived in these lands. Today, the Atayal are Taiwan's third largest group of native people, and they were once these notorious head-hunting warriors with facial tattoos that attested to their effectiveness in battle. One of the first military campaigns took place in the mountains near Sanxia, south of New Taipei City. This was the Dabao Incident. The Atayal versus the Japanese again. Japan tried everything they could to try and pacify the Atayal people. It would end up taking years before they were able to overcome the Atayal and force them to abandon their ancestral lands to the Japanese and migrate higher up into the mountains. Less than two decades after these camphor wars, the natural camphor industry took a hit when scientists figured out how to extract pinene from coniferous plants and trees. This resulted in the first synthetic camphor. Soon afterwards, German production of synthetic camphor broke the back of the natural camphor market. In 1930, DuPont and Soviet chemists learned how to use Fuller's Earth and titanium oxide to produce synthetic camphor, putting an end to the industry. Nowadays, 
Camp for production has been replaced by industrial chemicals synthesized from compounds that are found in turpentine. Taiwan's camphor industry collapsed, but the damage was already done, and there had been so many deaths on both sides from those extracting this waxy substance and from those who were trying to prevent them from doing so. Taiwan's indigenous people, they weren't the first ancient people to be killed and forced off their land by a bigger and more powerful antagonizer. And they weren't the last one either. For the Atayal indigenous people, at least, having all these camphor trees growing wild on their ancestral lands, it turned out to be more of a curse than a blessing. As soon as it became a critical commodity for the Japanese empire, they weren't going to allow anyone or anything to get in their way of obtaining it. It's ironic that as much damage as the Japanese did to eradicate indigenous culture, no one up to their time had done more to study them from an anthropological and taxonomical perspective. Taxonomy, it's a science of categorization and classification. During the period of Japanese colonial rule, their scientists conducted groundbreaking research that sorted out all the different indigenous people of Taiwan, their language, cultural aspects, everything. And all of this came in handy later on when Taiwan's next occupiers showed up. Since the takeover in 1895, Japan's number one priority had been to restore order and establish control. As I indicated, they did this quite fast. The warlordism that had plagued the Taiwan countryside was essentially stamped out. A judicial system was set up. There were courts and tribunals, and justice was very harsh if you ended up on the wrong side of the law. Plenty of horrific sentences were carried out that later on would become one of Japan's calling cards after 1937. 1902, the worst of the uprisings were over, and things began to settle down into this new normalcy. And though critics and apologists for the Japanese colonial period will argue this point, life wasn't too bad. Taiwan was clearly transforming into a modern 20th century place, just as Japan wanted. They were secretly determined to show the other world powers of the day that They, too, knew how to run a successful colony. Japan's initial attempts at colonization, in the case of the Ryukyu Islands and in the Kuril Island chain that they had exchanged with Russia for Sakhalin in 1875, those people were already very similar ethnically and culturally to the Japanese. The same was not true with the colonies they were trying to grow in Taiwan and in Korea. Not only were they not ethnically or linguistically similar to the Japanese. Their loyalties and sympathies heavily leaned in a westerly direction towards China. Japanese agricultural policies on Taiwan turned the island into a major food supplier. In the Japan home market, they depended on Taiwanese rice and sugar. By the 1920s, comparatively speaking, There wasn't a province in China that could grow more food than in Taiwan. Last episode, I mentioned that under Liu Mingchuan, the island's first railway was built that linked Tanshui and Taipei. By 1905, the Japanese had laid down ten times as many tracks. Japan had big plans, and building all this infrastructure was critical. They began with transportation, power, and communications. Lots of improvements. A monetary system was created. New industries were built from the ground up. Quantum leaps were made in hygiene and sanitation. Diseases that had killed tens of thousands over the years were brought under control or eradicated. Literacy made great leaps. 1905, Taiwan had its most comprehensive census to date. Foot binding was outlawed in 1910. And great strides were made in tamping down Taiwan's centuries-old opium addiction problem. Man, the Japanese really made the Qing Dynasty look bad. Speaking of the Qing Dynasty, they were overthrown in 1912 and because of all the distractions going on around them since 1895. Making a big deal about recovering Taiwan and turning this into a national cause never rose to the level of importance. Japan had gone nowhere but up since 1895. For China, those last 17 years of the Qing dynasty were excruciating. 
Everybody knows the great San Francisco earthquake of April 18th, 1906. Well, one month before San Francisco was destroyed, on the early morning of March 17th, the third deadliest earthquake in Taiwan history occurred. This was the 1906 Meishan earthquake. Meishan is a township just to the east of Jiayi. This one was a 6.8 trembler. It was one of those quakes where the earth actually split open and chasms were visible. Meishan was destroyed. Over 1,200 people killed and twice as many injured. The people lived in dwellings that were constructed from materials that just collapsed like a house of cards, and people died as they lay in bed, just getting ready to start their day, their home falling down on them. There will be seven more big earthquakes of 6.8 or higher, with a couple in the 8.0 range between the time of this Meishan earthquake of 1906 and the 1935 Shinchiku Tachu earthquake. This one took place 150 kilometers to the north in Sanyi, not far from the border of Miaoli County and Taichung City. Shinchiku was the new Japanese name for the city of Shinchu, and Tachu was Taichung. All the names of places were Japanified. This one in 1935 was the deadliest quake of all time, or at least since records of earthquakes on Taiwan were recorded. I'm sure the ancient peoples of Taiwan experienced much worse in their day, but in modern times at least, this earthquake of April 21st, 1935 remains the deadliest on Taiwan in terms of loss of life. Almost 3,300 people were killed and 12,000 injured, and over 50,000 residences were damaged or destroyed. Well, I think we're going to close on this tragic note, as you no doubt recall from the part one episode, the way things turned out for the island of Taiwan geologically. Well, they were fated to suffer the regular consequences of existing on and near these fault lines. There's still a lot more to go. We'll pick up next time in part six with more of the pushback against Japan, the locals and native people. Eh, Not everyone was happy and there were several disturbances that we'll look at next time. I know it sounds like the Taiwanese were so ungrateful, fighting back against the Japanese who seemed to be doing so much to improve the daily lives of the people, offering all kinds of modern services and opportunities to those who went along with the program. But we'll see. As we get closer to 1937, the Japanese stopped looking so benign and enlightened on Taiwan. So... I'm sure you won't want to miss that. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Once again, if you think one ad is one too many, may I invite you to consider subscribing to either CHP Premium or Patreon? Details are in the show notes. Ad-free listening and hey, all these other guys asking for money? Eh, Maybe you get the new material a few days early, a week at most. Pshaw. With CHP Premium and Patreon, you'll get access to new shows weeks early. And on top of all that, this is a great way to support me. My deepest thanks to everyone in my CHP community around the world who supports me through these two channels, and to you too for considering it. This here's Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, California. My thanks for listening, and it's my humblest of hopes that you'll all come back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.